This is Horror Podcast. Welcome to This Is Horror, a podcast for readers, writers, and creators. I'm Michael David Wilson, and every episode alongside my co-host Bob Pastorella, we chat with the world's best writers about writing, life lessons, creativity, and much more. Today, we are chatting with Josh Malaman, in the first in a three-part series of conversations about the release of his brand new collection, Spin a Black Yarn. And that will be out via the wonderful folks at Del Rey on August the 15th. Now, in this episode, we talk about Josh's current writing routine, the writing documentary he's filming, And we drop some news on a Ben Evans film starring the wonderful Sky Elabar of the Greasy Strangler fame. But before any of that, a quick advert break. Cosmovorus, the debut cosmic horror novel from R.C. Housen. Esmeralda has lived on the fringes of society for as long as she can remember, until a Halloween night gone wrong unlocks a cache of nightmarish memories. Visions of a bizarre desert town, Images of a mysterious woman, the pain of an ultimate betrayal, and the shame of a bargain made in blood. Now she must travel back and learn the true nature of the ravenous cosmos. Cosmovorus, available everywhere books are sold. From best-selling author Lee Mountford comes a new supernatural horror series perfect for lovers of demonic haunted houses. Book one, Haunted Perrin Manor, follows two sisters as they move into an old family home, only to discover evil already resides there. The series is available in ebook and paperback formats and high quality audiobooks from producer Hannibal Hills. Search Amazon and Audible for Haunted Perrin Manor now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Okay, with that said, here it is. It is Josh Malaman on This Is Horror. Josh, welcome back to This Is Horror Podcast. Hello, you two. It has been about three years because the last time you were on the podcast was actually for the release of Their Watching. So we did you know, the live podcast with you and Laurel Hightower. Oh, but yeah. then, yeah, in terms of talking about your own work, it was... Well, in fact, looking, that was about three years, too. So they're both three years. <laughs> there we go. Did we talk about inspection? Is that what we talked about last? Inspection? Well, last last Just time, I mean, we, we, we actually rape. spoke quite a lot about, you know, Spinner Black Yarn as in, you know, the production company. And then we spent some time talking about Carpenter's Farm. Oh, yeah. Okay, so since then... I'm going to get my bookshelf. Since then, <laughs> Mallory has come out. The wide release of Goblin, the wide release of Pearl, which I should never have changed that title. That's on me. Whatever. We can talk about that later. Ghoul in the Cape, Daphne, and now Spin a Black Yarn. Wow. That's a lot. A lot has happened since then. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, you know, I think is testament to you being so prolific or at least having the reputation of being prolific because we we know that like you know sometimes the release of stories and the order in which they were written doesn't necessarily kind of follow but i i mean it it leads into we we've got this question from alan baxter so yeah we're just gonna break format and have a patreon question at the start Okay, I love that guy, by the way. So this is great. Okay. Yeah. So he says, Josh is such a good writer, but also a prolific writer. So I'm wondering how long does a first draft tend to take and how many drafts usually go into a book? I know from my own writing that it can vary a lot, 
but is there an average for you? Um, yes, I would say that mostly the books take like four to six weeks, something like that for the rough draft. But then, yeah, I mean, you know, oh man, I'm looking at them all right now. I mean, the rewrites are crazy extensive. Uh, gosh, some of them six, seven, eight times. Bird Box was 11 times. And we're talking like, you know, rewriting and not mm-hmm. just like spell checking, you know. Um, Daphne, not as much. Um, but yeah, Daphne was, I even have the editorial response to Daphne on my office wall. Mm. It's sort of like the dream scenario. Every time a writer sends their rough draft or their first draft to their editor, they have this fantasy of like, this is the one where they're going to write back saying it's perfect, you know? <laughs> so like everyone, like you're totally, it never happens. The people write back, well, this is good, but we need to, we, it's gonna needs a lot of work still, you know? And my, the response to Daphne was like, yeah, this is almost done. I was like, oh. I like printed it up. It's like on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And um, so Daphne, not as much, but the rest, yeah, about that. But then just to get a little deeper, um, Ghoul in the Cape, because I knew it was going to be a beast of a book, it's 300,000 words. Um, because I knew that I did less per day. That sounds counterintuitive, but it, hear me out. I did less per day because I realized I would have to be writing four times the amount of like bird box. Mm. And and if I were to write the regular pace or whatever, I'd probably be burnt out after like, you know, halfway through that thing or something. So I intentionally like scaled back on the daily writing for Ghoul in the Cape and it took about a year to do it. Yeah. And it took like a couple months. Yeah. I wonder what that was like psychologically for you, you know, as somebody who wants to be, <laughs> writing more and to actually rein yourself in uh i didn't love it you know and i i tried another book where i only wrote 500 a day just Mm. just see what that was like and it was like maddening i would be like the writing session would end really fast i'm like oh no what am i doing now you know but then there's a million other things to do like short stories rewrites Mm. uh the band whatever it is so, you know, lined it up with other stuff. But at the same time, I'm very used to, once I start, like six weeks later, having like a rough draft. Mm-hmm. And there is, you can get kind of greedy for that. Um, you know what I mean? Almost like, um, I mean, I guess that's a good thing to be greedy for, though, as a rough draft of a novel. Right, but, right. but you can get kind of greedy for it. You're like, when, whenever I start a book, you're almost impatient. Like, I'm an impatient artist. But I have to be patient during the rewrites, as you both know. I mean, that, that's yeah. where that's where it becomes great or not. So, but thank you for those kind words, Alan. Yeah, and in in terms of you know each day in those four to six weeks, I mean, how long are you typically writing? When is the writing routine? And I know that probably about you know seven years ago when we first <laughs> spoke, we talked a little about writing routine but i'm gonna go out on a limb and you know it might have changed in that time no it gosh that's that's one of the weirdest things is that recently i um and i don't really normally post about this kind of thing or talk about this kind of thing because it's not my focus where my head's at but recently uh, my agent told me that bird box has sold over a million copies worldwide okay this was I didn't even understand what she was writing me. I, I had to respond like, wait, hold on. What are you, what are we talking about? And she's like, no, this is what happened. You know? And the, one of the first things that struck me aside from like, that's insane was that my routine has not changed at all in the, let me just do this real fast. Uh, like six, seven years leading up to getting a book published. And the now eight years or so since having a book published, it's been exactly the same, which is about, an average of like just over two novels a year. So by the time Bird Box came out, I had like 14 written or something. And it's been exactly the same since. Haven't, um, you know, it's not like, oh, Bird Box came out. Now let's start thinking strategically. Mm. Now let's start thinking, you know, trends. Now let's start thinking bestseller list. It's exactly the same. I just made a documentary on, on the writing of a novel. I just filmed it. Like filmed from scratch. I cannot wait for you to see this okay this is like this is wild this is like a man 
losing his mind in, in his office. But it struck me while making this documentary that I have no idea, like, if this is ever coming out, is this going into the into the pile of 25? I don't know what, what's going to happen to them. Is this going to be a book in a year? I have no idea. So when I got that note from Kristen, I guess I'm, I'm going to say there was kind of a moment of, like, pride that I haven't, that that hasn't changed at all. Now, in in and of him, uh, each, each, like each book has its own routine. Like Goo in the Cape, I said, was different than most. Bird Box, for whatever re reason, was written between like 8 a.m. and like noon every day. Uh, Incidents Around the House was like 8 at night to midnight. And it seems to be that once a book starts, like it, it, um, it's, the same, it's the same every day till it's done. And I'll bet you, you guys are similar and anyone listening where the average writing session is like three, four hours of actually sitting there writing. It doesn't seem like anyone does much. You might have a marathon day or a shorter day, but it seems like the average for every writer I've ever talked to is about three or four hours a day. Is that the same for you guys? Yeah. I mean, it, I've tried to do more. And when I was writing full time I was really trying to make it a nine to five but I just noticed very quickly there are diminishing returns yeah. so rather than fighting rather than making the last four hours hellish why not say you know you've got three or four hours once it's done you can you're free to do other things you know you can do of a work or you can, you know, occasionally, why don't you just unwind? Why don't you do something not related to the work? Because I mean, it, it can become an obsession, particularly when you have time to fill, you can almost feel guilty if you're not. But I, I feel it's kind of like, you know, if you go to the gym, if you're working out, if you're looking to build muscle, you're not like, no, I must do this all day. You're going to injure yourself. And I wonder if there's something kind of similar creatively. I do feel that we only have so much in the tank every day. Yeah, I agree. Um, occasionally I get like a staycation and I, I'll, I'll play, uh, hey, let's see if Bob can be a full time writer and do it nine to five. You know, so and I'll have my little schedule and uh, I might get maybe like a day of nine to five, you know, and but after that, it's like, you know, there's so many distractions that you can you can pass off as writing. I'm going to watch a movie that's still writing. I'm going to read this book that's still writing because you're getting inspired and things like that. And then you find that you get off, you know, in the fuck off zone. Uh, and then, you know, your actual writing, like what you're talking about, Josh, is like maybe you, you might you might actually be able to do three or four hours in a stretch. Uh, so that that seems like the, the, that's like a sweet spot. Yeah. Um, I try to get through like a scene. That's that's my main goal and start the next scene. If it takes me 30 minutes to get, if I get in that zen where I'm just cruising and it takes me 30 minutes to write a scene and I'm happy with it and I can start the next scene, I, I, I'm like, hey, I'm done. I'm done. There's still a little gas in the tank, but I'm not going to push it uh, because that's when the writing starts getting really shitty. And, you know, it, it, we give ourselves permission to write shitty, but you don't want to deliberately write shitty. You know, so, I mean, it, it's I, I don't like the idea of pushing it. Uh, to the limit. That's um, saying what you just said about writing a scene because it, it. I know exactly what you mean. Um, I have more. For me, it's more like um, like if I'm near the near enough to the end of the scene, like it feels really wrong to step away because you're like, oh, I but no, I did my allotted time today. No, 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 no. Get over here, buddy. You have to finish this moment. You know, because you don't want to leave like the moment. You know, but it still seems like. I think I've even read like like famous authors. It's like three, four hours. I don't know what it is. It's like some creative cycle or something. You kind of run out of gas. And then, like you were saying, like the idea of like there are other things to do. You could do interviews. You can do, um, you know, work on that documentary that I was talking about. Like whatever it is, there are a million other things you can do. And you are still doing something for your writing. And I'm becoming less and less enchanted with uh, social media, like less and less by the day. 
man, I, I don't know about I don't know about you two, but it's just becoming. And this was the reason for making the documentary mm. is that I just do not speak Twitter. I don't speak that language. It's me. Like some a thought that crosses my mind often when I'm online is like, just because you don't air grievances doesn't mean you don't have any. Yeah. And yeah. and it seems to me that like everyone feels like they must. It, like it just, it's very, to me, it's a very negative place. Twitter is. And maybe I'm like sensitive in that way. Fine. Who cares? Whatever. But I don't speak in uh, permanent opinions or like that, like, you know, permanent declarations. Uh, if a scenario arises that morning, I probably need more than an hour or five minutes to know which side of this I'm on or whatever the hell. Yeah. That is. So I started like, you know, I would find myself posting a bit about writing like, Oh, today's writing session was this or that. And even that felt like, just like I was speaking a different language. That's when I started thinking, how can I express how I feel about writing a novel without doing it on like online and without it being mm. like a social media thing. Cause none of those formats, they all, they all feel, I don't know. It's just like insincere to me or something. Like they all feel like strategy to me, mm. even, even though like sort of the kindest or like the people that are maybe best at it and warmest, they it still feels like strategy. And so I was like, okay, you need to fill, like you need a bigger canvas. You need to film the process of writing a novel so that you can literally on the spot discuss these things and the camera can see the look in your eye, how you really feel, the tone of your voice. So it's not some misinterpreted tweet or something. And that's when I started thinking, okay, you need to make a movie of this. So about three books ago, I sat down to do it. And then I was like, um, I was like, no, no fucking way, dude. No, I'm not, I'm not I'm like writing a book is enough. I'm not filming this. No way. And so I was forget it. I just wrote the book. Two books ago, I was like, dude, you should do it now, man. You should, you should do it. And I was like, no, I know that is so much work. And then this time around, I just freaking did it. I was just like, no, look, if you don't do it now, you're never going to do this. And it was, it was a little freaky at first. Um the very first day of it, I didn't know exactly like what the hell I was doing. And I went and told Allison, you know, I was like, because I'd been talking about it for like a year or two years now or something. And I said to Allison, uh, like, I don't know what to say like to the camera. And she was like, just be yourself. And I was like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah. But, but it got easier. It got like looser. And then it got more than easy. It got, it became exactly what I was hoping it would be, which is like, yeah, this looser, nuanced, I hope, joyful, passionate, but also troubled and not self-doubting, but like, you know, writing a novel is intense, as we all know. And that's all on tape. And and so I feel like, yeah, I feel really good about it. I can't wait for you to see this. Yeah, yeah. Well, we, we may return to the social media comments because there's so much to say about that, you know, much of which I am in complete agreement with you on. But I want to talk more about the logistics of filming this documentary. I mean, who was involved with the filming? Was this like purely you setting up the cameras? Or like, is Alison involved? Is there a crew involved? If there is, I mean, and you're writing a novel, there's this guy over there. Isn't that a little bit distracting? Did you like then have kind of segments like in every American TV show where you're like, so when I was writing this scene, this is what was going through my mind. You know, I, I want to know as much as you're prepared to talk about. Do you have scenes outside of the house as well? No, like you're walking really. around. It's, it's no. like, like a man in his office losing yeah. his mind. Um, yeah. So we, we have been working with, um, a produ producers um, called Beck Woods. They did A Quiet Place. They did um, Haunt. They did this new movie, 65. They did The Boogeyman. They wrote The Boogeyman. And we've been shopping with them, Carpenter's Farm, to TV. Mm -hmm. um, them as producers, Spin a Black Yarn as producers, uh, another fella, Andy, writing it and, and so forth. Like this, he would be writing those scripts, screenplays, whatever. And in the course of working with them, this came up. The idea that I was going to do this documentary. And they were like, hey, uh, we've never seen that before. We've never seen like a documentary on a, a guy writing a novel. 
can we produce this for you? And I was like, what? Uh, I, my plan was film it on this thing, the computer, mm. and edit it with iMovies and put it on YouTube, done. Like I, I figured if we had a video of Stephen King having done that with Cujo, we'd all, we'd all like, we, we'd all have watched it five times. You know, it might not be a great movie, but we'd all love to see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that was like the thinking, but they were like, no, we can get you, set you up with better audio gear. And they did. I have it right here. These awesome like road microphones here. Look at Oh these. yeah. Yeah. And then, um, hooked me up with like a better camera. And now this is the most amazing part. So this, it was a camera phone and um, not, uh, not uh, what's the right phrase here? There's no like actual, it doesn't work as a phone, but mm -hmm. it still doesn't connect to like the iCloud or whatever. So I would film that day and they could literally right at, when I hit stop, it goes to the iCloud and they could view it. Mm -hmm. So they were literally able to watch the dailies, quote unquote, the dailies. And they were able to say, like, to weigh in on, like, what was happening and what you're, what I was doing and stuff like that. But it was essentially just, I mean, it kept getting crazier and crazier in here. And But having them um, weighing in or, or just even responding at all or just knowing that they were, like, it wasn't just me, that, like, helped propel it along. You know what I mean? I feel like yeah. if I was doing it myself after three days, I might have been like, oh, I'm not going to, I'm not doing this stupid camera again, you know? Yeah. But knowing that it was someone else involved, there was a little bit more of like, okay, okay, come on, let, let's do this. So no, there was no one else in the office with me. Well, Allison did a few scenes, but there was no one else in the office, but they helped with gear, that initial setup and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. they are currently like editing it as we speak. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad too that you know this is like a kind of independently produced documentary with like good intentions because uh, again like I'm imagining if this was like for American primetime TV they'd be like oh. okay well you you need to have you need to have a bit where you're really struggling maybe you and Allison have an argument about it like they you know that they'd throw that in God, I can't believe you're saying that because there is that feeling not not from anyone but there is a feeling like, when have you ever watched the documentary and like it wasn't tragic? Yeah. Right. You know what I mean? Like this is like this documentary is is like. Did you ever see American Movie? Mm. You guys ever seen American Movie where that dude makes that horror movie on his own and his best friend and all that? You never saw these crazy lo-fi dude. It's sounding familiar. Man, it, it does sound familiar. <laughs> you gotta watch that movie. You gotta watch the movie. Anyway, this is what that that reminds me of is like. I started watching some of the footage. I'm like, this dude's insane. Meaning me. I was like, this guy is freaking nuts. Like there's times where I'm like, just like playing the drums on my desk, like for a long time, like, like reading the, like, like I'm reading to a metronome. I'm like, filming, like I'm playing basketball in my office. There's no women here. Like, like after a while you, you watch this and you're going to be like, wow, this dude is really, this guy's far out. And that was, that was fun for me. But the thought crossed my mind. Where's the doubt here? Where's the troubled here? Where's, but I, it's just not, I don't operate that way. I don't have imposter syndrome. Never have. I don't doubt it. I'm like, yeah, if it sucks now, we'll make it better later. Mm -hmm. You know? And like, and if there was any like problems, like, uh, like a fight with Allison, I guess, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I, that would be an, I guess, I guess I could film that, but that would seem like kind of an odd thing to include or something. But but maybe, maybe that would be a good thing to include. I don't know. But you get what I'm saying is mm. that I noticed the lack of that in the raw footage. And, and it's interesting that you say that because now I'm wondering, because you're saying it, that that's an American television show thing. I'm wondering if I'm like conditioned to think that a documentary is supposed to be tragic. Right. I mean, I, I see that aspect of it, but, I, but I mean, immediately what comes to mind, and this is, I mean, to me, it's funny and I'm sure that what you did is not funny, but it would almost be like, what's, what's the, uh, the guy who did the, the nature documentaries? Um, David Attenborough? Yes. And so I said, we see the writer in his habitat, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, you know, and then and you, they show you drumming on the desk and all this, you know, and I'm like, okay, that, that, that could be a way to go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I'm that like, could be a way to go. I'm like snorting lines. Like, <laughs> 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 
The studious writer is it. <laughs> yeah, the, the studious <laughs> writer <laughs> imbibing <laughs> his inspirations, <laughs> sometimes quite literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, yeah, but then here's my take on that. Damn it, is <laughs> like I'm as plagued with not doubt, but like. Dude, I worry about shit. I worry about money. I worry if the books are good. I worry about all this shit. And that's what I was saying before. Just because you don't air your grievances doesn't mean you don't have any. Mm -hmm. like I'm just not really the kind of guy to be like, this all sucks. It's like I'm more like, okay, I'm writing a book. It's hard. Yes, this is hard. Yes, I'm going to be like, oh, God, that was that pay, that passage is so freaking embarrassing. You didn't need this chapter at all. Great, great, great. But it's all under the umbrella of we're writing a novel, which is a very in and of itself optimistic endeavor because number one it implies there's meaning in things like what you know to, to accomplish anything and number two it sort of implies somebody else would read it and yeah. so to me, the act of writing at all in and of itself is optimistic even if there's a struggle i i was thinking about this the other day particularly because the current novel i'm writing it's called daddy's boy it has the most like dick jokes and euphemisms I've ever put in any project. It's kind of like, I don't know, the Greasy Strangler meets a Joe R. Lansdale or heist. And I thought, how optimistic is this act? That I, like there was just a moment where I came out of myself almost. It's like, how optimistic is this? I'm spending like a substantial amount of time. Like I've spent the best part of a year on this and it's like just, it is an extended dick joke in a sense. So there's um, got to be a lot of optimism to even do that. I cannot wait. I, I want to read. I would, I would like to be one of your first, you be one of your first dick joke readers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's also a good book title, Dick Joke. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to consider <laughs> changing the title. <laughs> 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 or do I like call it Daddy's Boy and then underneath it's like a, a dick joke novel, which then implies that like, you know, there's a load of them. Like do do I start the subgenre? <laughs> this is a uh, similar to how splatter punk. <laughs> yes. Dick joke punk. <laughs> 30 years from now you'll be like honoring for this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's the Splatterpunk Awards. Is the world ready for the Dick Joke Awards? I, I, I feel we're probably in the wrong decade. It's like if that was going to kick off, that was like the 90s or the noughties. This is, if I consider the climate we're in, this is not, this is not the moment. Yeah, I think we missed the Dick Joke era, but, but you never know. You never yeah. know. Yeah. You're, you're really onto something. I mean, things are cyclical. Maybe it will return. <laughs> we'll find out. It's like Clark's. I'm going to bring it back. I'm bringing it back. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, w with the cameras as well, did you feel, at least to begin with, a little bit self-conscious? Or did you feel, you know, like may maybe there are things that you would normally do that you're like, well, shit, there's a camera there. I better uh, not do that. Or, or on the reverse end, did you ever feel like there was a need to perform because you know quite often like I'm writing a story and I'm silent but maybe if there's cameras I might want to turn to it and be like oh well this is the bit with the dialogue now I don't know <laughs> I miss by the way I've missed you guys wow wow um, my Thank face you. hurts right now from smiling and we've only, I don't even know how long we've been talking my freaking face hurts um <laughs> So uh, it was liberating. It was liberating the whole thing because, again, I mean, I don't know how to explain it. It's not like I hate people on Twitter. That's of course not. That's not what I mean. I just that is just so not home for me. It's just so mm. unimpressive. It's just so bland to me. It's so transparent to me. It's just it's. I, I'm just not into it. Mm. And so I've been like for like a couple of years now. Like, how do I? Like, who can I talk to about this? I'm going to talk to Allison. There's 50 hours of footage, you know? What am I going to talk to Allison for? Hey, baby. Yeah. Hear me out. And then 50 hours of talking about writing the novel. So it it was just liberating, man. It was like looking the camera in the eye and like there was like a gleefulness about like I'm finally talking about this and about and not thinking like, is someone going to think I'm too upbeat? 
Is someone going to say that I'm toxically positive? Is somebody going to say that I'm like, oh my God, like, dude, I'm writing a novel and I'm electric with it and I want to talk about it, you know, and, and talk about the, the problems of it too and blah, blah, blah. And so it was, it was just liberating. But the first couple of days were a little nerve wracking. After that, just, a, it was a free, free, uh, free fall. Yeah. Kind of a free fall. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a downward spiral perhaps. <laughs> right. Right. No, I, I, I can't wait to see it either. And you know, whatever form it takes, whatever channels it comes out on, I will be watching this because, you know, it sounds amazing. And I asked them if I could edit it and they were like, no, 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 no. I'm like, no, but I have to, no, 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 no. We're, we're going to get like a real editor. So I was like, okay, fine. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you were kind of submitting each day's session, did, did you ever give them kind of timestamps? They'll be like, oh, 38 minutes in you're not going to believe what i did so i want you to pay close you're attention to that amazing, you really are i'm asking amazing questions as if you've done this or something like because <laughs> oftentimes um a segment like closer to the end of it would be the great the great moment so if i was filming for six minutes around like 4 45 something exciting starts to happen and that that was became like almost routine with it so I did talk to them about that. I'm like, most of these clips, like the latter third of them is where like the more interesting stuff happens or the more interesting like revelation or you know, whatever thing to, thing to say, or maybe I had a, an idea for the book or started doing something really weird in the office, whatever it is, it almost always came later in, in the, in, late mm -hmm. in the segment. So that, yeah. 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 I'm, so I'm, not, I'm not put together enough to, to have thought in terms of stop timestamps, but yeah. I said, I'm like, it's late in the clips. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it sounds like we, you were turning the, the camera on, you were recording at specific moments rather than literally just having it recording the entire time. Oh, or, my God. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I yeah. can't even. In terms of the writing itself, I, do, I try to just kind of get creative with, like, camera. Like, for a while, I had the, um, uh, the camera phone like directly above me and there's some awesome shots of the so i'm writing and the yeah. cats are walking around like the computer like walking around yeah. the desk while i'm writing and and there were some some moments like that but very little of this is actually me just sitting there writing i mean what what is that what the hell does that mean it is there yeah. was a couple there's a funny moment where i i started that way and so i'm like all right sentence one and like right away like the first word i spelled wrong and i was like god damn it <laughs> i was like and there are like many, many moments like that where it's like, I get the feeling that somebody who is trying to write a novel or trying to write their first novel, if they saw this movie, they're like, they're going to be like, if that dude can do it, I can do it. Yeah. 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 No, I, I hope that's what they walk away with. I wondered too, if like, you know, you, you needed to get some hours of you writing just so they can do some sort of time lapse and like, do, 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 do. And I like you drumming and do a line what <laughs> it's like all sped up <laughs> pretty pretty soon there's actually a drum set behind them like, there's a, a drum set between us yeah that's a great idea now i kind of want to film that yeah. <laughs> i do have a drum set in this house yeah. huh. there you go is it, is, is it too late can you be like we've got an emergency scene <laughs> guys don't hold the presses. It's like the end of a movie. The yeah. music is swelling. I'm racing for the airport with this scene of. Yeah. <laughs> that would be a great in credits. Yeah. One more scene. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I, yeah. I honestly think I'm going to do this. I'm going to bring the drums in the office. That's a brilliant idea. Okay. Well, even if it's an end credits, it could be a, like, where is he now? Oh, <laughs> that's what he's doing now. <laughs> I pan out and my office is in a mental home. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, to, to briefly return to, you know, social media, I mean, I, I think a lot of people have a similar relationship with social media, like not many writers say, you know what I love about marketing or, you know what I love about writing? It's the tweets. It's putting a tweet out. That is why I got into this. But that's a good point. That yeah. Good point. Yeah. But, but, but I think 
I mean, I mean, there's many things going on with social media. For one, I mean, a lot of people have been conditioned to a point where it almost becomes part of your brain. You have a thought, you're like, oh, well, I better put that out in a tweet. No, no, no. You can have a thought, you can let it pass, and you didn't open Twitter. That's okay. So that that's kind of one side of it. And you know, I'm not being hyperbolic about that. There are literally studies to show that this is affecting your brain chemistry. So it is something that you have to be pretty careful about. But then on the other hand, I mean, it is a marketing tool. It is a device to try and get your work out there. And I think a lot of people are battling with the idea as to like, well, how how essential is this? Or what is the minimum effective dose. I mean, I got rid of Facebook about three years ago. And since doing that, it hasn't been like, wow, there's been a real decline in terms of like people knowing who I am. So it's like, you can clearly get rid of a number of platforms and then see no detrimental effect. I mean, the only one that I'm really on is Twitter at the moment. Obviously, we're now putting the video, the podcast out as a video on YouTube, but I, I see that as a, a separate, it's a kind of social media, but it's also a platform for publishing your work in a sense. Oh, yeah. No, but, I absolutely see your, your podcast the same way I would see like a novel, the same right. way I see a documentary. This, this is like, not to sound, you know, not to hit someone the wrong way, but this, this is art. What's happening? Yeah. <laughs> We are, we're in the middle of art right now. No, but really we are like, this, this is art and like the, the tweet and like the, the strategy of the online, even like, even the like engagement stuff, I'm just like, oh my God, no, I can't, I can't, I can't even, I can't even do this right now. You know? Yeah. And also, I didn't have a cell phone until I was 31 or something. Right. So there is sometimes this sort of longing for the before this in me. I understand the potential merits of like this stuff. Mm. It's just not me, man. It's just not my language. It's just not. It's like, I, I even feel like me on the telephone, uh, I'm not as effective as like what we're doing right now. I'm right. just more myself, like in an actual, like personal mm. moment. Yeah. 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 And so, so I wonder now, you know, with, with the success that you've, enjoyed with like that you know like that there's a level of fame to a point people if a josh malaman book comes out they will buy it even even if nobody really mentioned it i mean one person would have to mention it just so that they're aware that it is out but you know assuming that one person has done their job it it would sell to a point so are you considering just not being on social media is that something you would do? Know. Have you reached a level where you could just be like, I'm done? No, no, I don't think so. But, but not only that, like I have fun writing messages, you know, mm. like with friends and stuff. And I oh mean, God, that's about it though, man. I mean, I don't, <laughs> I, no, I would, I would, I would definitely feel weird if like I had like an account, like, like even an author account that someone mm. else ran. I would feel weird about that, right? Like, mm. you know, it's like, hi, I'm uh, Jim. I'll be running, I'll be answering for job. Like, no, 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 we're not doing anything like that. But it also does feel a little like, not reactionary, but a little like permanent as well to get off of everything. Mm. Something about that feels a little too too severe to me. So, what, so yeah. what are the options, right? The options are just, I mean, which is what I do and not spend that much time on there. And when I do go on there, I'm just like, oh my God, I went so mad. Everyone's so mad. <laughs> but yeah. I don't yeah. know. I just live in a like, man, I just live in like a different place than than the vibe. Whatever that vibe is, I don't live there. That's not the yeah. frequency. That's not the radio station I listen to. That's not the frequency I'm at. I don't speak that language. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that we've spoke about this to a point on the podcast before, but I do hate those very firm statements that you often see on Twitter that will be along the lines of if you do this or if you think this or if x y and z 
you're a piece of shit or that's wrong or that's not it there's almost an orwellian 1984 that this is not the correct way to think and that is very scary for me not least because you know i just think there's so much nuance and i i think on most sides of a discussion there are good points and there are bad points and you know even if there's going to be one side that i gravitate towards there's probably something on the other end of the argument that you know i'm in agreement with and it's like well you can see how that is a you know you can see why they came to that conclusion or what happened there and i think too as you said before new facts emerge new information emerges new ways of thinking so it's just really dangerous to say this is bad when it's like but we we no, don't like we, i don't know yeah I don't know anything about like the story it whatever it was the news comes out like literally like an hour before and everyone has like such strong things to say i'm just not that kind of guy like mm. that doesn't mean that i'm like a spineless jellyfish with no opinions yeah but that also doesn't mean that i'm like some super hardened guy with opinions that i'm afraid to write down no 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 no, no. it's not that mm. it's like i just like um i'm doing my thing i saw that news it once was the news would come out you'd hear something happen and then maybe it came up a couple of times during the day and then maybe you saw something on TV again about it at night. And so in the course of that, there was a lot of space for you to either think about it or not. Maybe you talk to someone, learn something about it or not, this kind of thing. But how it how these things are set up now, let's just say like um, a fight between writers or something strange like that. Not only will you hear about it, but like in kaleidoscope. So now it's like you hear about it, you hear about it like a thousand times in one day. And it doesn't really even give you a, the opportunity to sit and think like, what do I think about that? Yeah. Because it's like, yeah. do, 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 like coming at you and it's not like, hold on, I don't know either of these writers. I don't know what either of them are like. I don't know anything. You know what I mean? I don't know what the hell is going on in their lives right now. But then maybe a few days later, I do have an idea of it. Like you realize mm. this guy was a prick or something. Okay, fine. That's fine. But it's that sort of the permanence of it like, I'm just, I don't know. I'm just coming from a much brighter vibe. Like, mm. this, this, this is the best way I feel like I can explain it. If Twitter was a party, I would have walked in, turned to Allison and been like, eh, yeah, let's go. Where, you wanna, you wanna, <laughs> I would have been like, you want to try, you want to try the bar up the street? Yeah. If that, if that yeah, was yeah. a bar, I would, I wouldn't have stayed five minutes. Yeah. 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 And I think the other thing as well is that there seems to be with some people a, a pressure to state an opinion on a matter very, very quickly. And and like, as we've said, number one, I'm going to need a little bit longer to to understand even what's going on. But also often I think, you know. Who, who who the fuck am I? Who 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 well, is thinking? Do, right? I need to know what Michael David Wilson thinks before I can I move on from that, this. Some of that too, a little bit of that. But but okay, how about this idea? And we obviously we don't talk about this the whole time, but it feels like we could. But um, if you do not have, and this is where I kind of understand what I'm seeing out there, if you do not have like um an artistic outlet or an expression, an outlet. You have this, you guys write, I write, I'm in a band, all this stuff. Imagine then how social media would look to you because it could look then as this is how I'm going to express myself. Mm. But if you're already doing that for hours with a novel, you're already doing that for hours in a, with an album, when you get online, you're not thinking in terms of express myself. Mm. You're already like got that out of you. We, we even just said the three, four hour creative like limit or whatever the hell we're talking mm. about, right? So you get online. Now imagine though that you don't have an outlet. You're mad about something. Like if I'm mad about something and I'm writing a song, I guess more music, I don't know, I guess it would come out maybe in there. It doesn't matter. You get what I'm saying? Now imagine someone that doesn't have an outlet and they sit down. Then I, I, I understand. I understand or I can empathize with wanting to express yourself and having an outlet. But to someone who, does, who um, has one before sitting down to the computer, it all feels very, um, what's the right word? Um, not unnecessary, but very sort of transparent. 
Mm. Like I've been like, oh, I can see, I can see what's going on. You felt like you had to say this. You felt you had to say this. And I'm like, to me, it's like, I already got it out. Whether it's in what we're doing right now, writing a novel, writing an album, talking to friends who are like philosophical minded or just whatever, like-minded friends. So those, those, those opinions, um, those initial reactions are already out in certain ways. And then I sit down and all I want to do is, is make dick jokes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you talk about reactions, I mean, that that's, that's what's happening is I, our attention spans have gotten so short that we're like in a soundbite era and that goes both ways. It's so we, we process information very quickly. We don't get the entire story. We don't have time to actually process it and think about it and find out what our opinion is on it if we have an opinion at all. And what right. social media does is it forces you to have an opinion about something that is a reaction to something. And you are going to react in the same way that you received. You received a soundbite. You, 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 you know, give out a soundbite. And other people are now, and so it causes this cascading effect of everyone's reacting to what you just said. At the end of the day, it doesn't fucking matter. Right. I mean, and usually the arguments that you see uh, online about stupid shit is, is, is quite simply because somebody needs to be, you know, look them square in the eye face to face and go, you're stupid. You really well, are. Well, well, you know, or, or Bob, because or Bob. a lot of that, a lot of those comments that people make, they, they, they get an opinion and people, people worshiping them. And it's like, man, wait, this guy's stupid. And that makes me get off social media. That makes me go, okay, I'm done. Yeah, I'm yeah, done. Yeah. I'm going to go, I'm going to go for a ride. I'm going to go read. I don't want to see this bullshit anymore. You know, you know, it is strange. It seems like certain people are delegated. Like this guy is the truth in this lane or something like that. Or this, yeah. you know, this lady is the truth in this field or something. And it's like, no, yeah, I know. I know. It's very, <laughs> again, and I'm not trying to change the subject. It's what led me to the documentary is that I was right. like, I need a different way or a different place to An talk outlet. about things. Yeah. Because when I would write stuff, um, and I Facebook's a little more fun because because for me because it's like mostly family and friends, but Twitter is especially like like a like cold like outer uh, solar system to me, and but it's like <clears throat> I don't know how to exp explain it because like I get it, I empathize, I understand wanting to express yourself, wanting to say something, but it seems to me it feels like. Um, there's that word again, strategic. Mm -hmm. the people that do well on there, it feels very, very strategic. That like, you're like really every day, you're like, well, you know, like every day you wake up with an engaging question for everybody in your life. Okay, buddy. You know what I mean? No, you don't. You wake <laughs> yeah. up and you're like, I need to engage, you know, because for this silliness. And then yeah. that's going to die one day. And then it's like, what was all this? But what's not going to die one day? Um, well, the whole planet might, but is the novel you write, the documentary you make, the uh, podcast you guys are doing now. Like these to me, they're talk about like, there's a permanence to me in Ghoul in the Cave that is mm -hmm. I could not find in social media in a, in a gazillion years. Even, yeah. even if I wrote 300,000 words worth, words worth, 300,000, 3, 300, hello, 300,000, 300,000 words worth <laughs> on social media. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. If any yeah. listeners are into all that, whatever, lo I love you. Let's like come hang out. I would. You're never going to get to know me on there, and not, not that you would want to necessarily. Yeah. If you do want to, let's hang out because it's whatever that is online. That's that's like the truncated, muted me. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, li listeners of the podcast know that me and Bob, yeah, you know, semi regularly disagree with each other, and we're not afraid to call each other out on different things or to express our differences in opinion and i mean i guess like the, the way that like bob sometimes view, views things is a little bit different to me as it should be and so like i never really think like oh this person is stupid this person is an idiot i'm trying to think well why, why have they came to this conclusion or like what well, what's going on here so i i don't want to write anyone off yeah, as an idiot I yeah, yeah. I, I think we're all 
we're all like a kind of product of all our experiences and our circumstances. And I genuinely think that like the vast majority of people, what they're doing, they're doing it because they think it's right. They've came to these conclusions because they think they're right. They're not an idiot. Perhaps they're misguided sometimes, but I, I don't want to view, you know, my, my fellow humans, as it were, as idiots. There's just differences in opinion, different conclusions. So, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to be as positive as I can. Your positivity is toxic. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't wait to say that. <laughs> this one, yeah. I, will not, I will not stand with the first time I saw that phrase. I was like, oh, somebody's going to capture me. <laughs> he's got this toxic part, positivity that's but just yeah, killing me like, like, this, this guy doesn't have imposter syndrome like pull out the torches <laughs> this guy actually like thinks like that we're all capable of writing a classic novel literally every bo both of you me undoubtedly us uh, almost every single person i've met in the scene is capable of writing a classic mm. and, like if that's toxic then sorry yeah <laughs> yeah i i i just prefer you know it, it's better for my mental health it's better for my being it's better for my soul to think what if it happens to me rather than it will never happen to me because even if, if i think what if or i i know you before josh like you you took it even stronger you said well why not me and it's like yeah it has to be someone why not me and even if you go through life and then it never and then it didn't actually happen, but the fact that you believed that it could probably means that you had a better life. Amen, amen to all of that. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I think like there, and, and also here's a big one: is the idea of, um, and I think that people think this of other authors as well. That like the last book, or like however good you think he or she is, that's as good as they are ever going to be. But like mm. people have breakthroughs, people get better. People like people will have like suddenly like a brilliant movie, just in the same way that you know, the opposite might happen, where a, a favorite director or writer of yours writes like a total lemon novel or makes a bad movie, whatever it is. So I I don't have a permanent opinion, even on like my fellow writers, because there's mm. like there's a guy who's like rolling right now. Well, he might not forever, okay. But if there's someone who like I read a book and it was like it's all right. That next one could be literally be a classic, and I, I believe mm. that. And so, if you turn that same idea towards yourself, mm. every, every time you sit down to write, there is the potential to do something like The Shining. There is the potential to do something like The The Loney. Um, uh, what's his name? Uh, um, I just read it. Uh, Philip Roth, Portnoy's Complaint, um, Beloved. Like there is you you anyone listening? You too, me. We have a potential like classic in us or, or mm. numerous ones, whether or not it comes out or whether or not it comes out exactly how we would want, whatever. To me, that's not just, um, what's the right phrase? That's not just to satiate some self-doubt or something. Like I, I like, I believe that. I believe that you guys sitting down the, the, the book that you <laughs> said that you're working on right now, as funny, as silly as we're being about it for all I know, it's like absolutely brilliant. And I have that open mind with each, like every other author in like the horror scene. You know, if there's like, um, Todd Kiesling recently made that, did you see that, that, um, that, uh, collage, like picture of like 300, like horror faces and stuff. Did you guys see that? It's awesome. It's amazing. I, I, I see it. Yeah. yeah it's we're on there, Michael. <laughs> are, you, are we? Yeah. Yeah. You both oh. are on there. Okay. Yeah. We're both on there. We're yeah, like front and center. Our, our faces are real big. They're bigger than everybody's. You know, I... <laughs> no, 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 no. no. That, but really, we're on there. Yeah, we are on there. I really, when I saw that he made that, I was like, I'm so glad that somebody did this about this moment in time. Mm -hmm. Exactly what I'm saying. Like everybody in that, everybody in that frame, I know Lovecraft is no longer with us in Poe, <laughs> no but He's everyone not. in that frame has like the potential of doing something brilliant. Mm-hmm. I think Michael's looking at it right now. <laughs> Look, you know, when you when you mentioned it, I thought <laughs> I'm interested in seeing this. When you said we're on it, obviously there's a lot of ego. <laughs> like, wait, I'm, 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 I'm fucking looking at it right now. <laughs> Did you find it? 
I'm, I'm, I was trying to find it and I know yeah. I was doing it subtly like, until Bob called me out. So <laughs> temporarily. Oh, well, like I, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah. I, guess, I guess all this to say just for me and, and, and we, and I'm actually kind of like glad that we are talking about this. Cause it was like an opportunity for me to like, kind of like get some of this off my chest, I guess. But for me, I would, I would just prefer to, okay. Express myself through no- novels, through albums. But if it comes to like, but these are so far, you know, fictional, right? That, you know, it's a, that's a weird idea. A nonfiction album is a really weird idea. But like, that sounds, I was born July 24th. My mom's name is Debbie. <laughs> my dad's name is Steve. Anyway, so even with the like nonfiction, like the express yourself, like what the equivalent of what social media might be, even that I feel like has to have some degree of like artistic groove to it. That's, it's just the only place I'm at home. And so the documentary was, yeah, was much needed. You know, to go back to something you were talking about, how, how like, you know, you, how you, you, each one of us has the ability to, to, to do something that would be considered like a classic, like a classic novel or something like that. Yeah. And, and if you look at any type of artist career, you will see highs and lows and peaks and valleys and things like that. I mean, and it's like, I'm a, I'm a metal head. So it's like, I use Judas preset, for example, um, because they, they tend to front load their albums. They have gone through highs and lows. They have, uh, changed styles, uh, sometimes to the point of being completely drastically changing styles. Yet, when they go to the studio and they write a song, they're not, you know, and, and or they're, or they're, you know, recording an album. They're not going, you know, like on, on Screaming for Vengeance. They're like, okay, you know, the hits are going to be, uh, you, you got another thing coming. Um, and then, you know, Hellion, Electric Eye, uh, and then uh, Devil's Child, they'll like that. Uh, so, and it was like, because if they thought that, that would be, you know, hey, there's the four tracks. We're done. We did an EP. Great. Bam. They put their heart and soul into every single song that they wrote and every single song that they played, not knowing how it was going to be, uh, you know, yeah. uh, reacted to or, or, or what type of reaction they were going to get uh, in, the, you know, in the court of public opinion and all that. But they put their heart and soul in there, just like writers put their heart and soul in every single project that they write, yeah. every single story that they write, every single character that we write. So the the concept that that hey you know this person uh you know they wrote they wrote this book but the last couple of books weren't that good to that to that writer those those books may have been a breakthrough for them it may have been a turning point for them it may have been something that they're extremely extremely proud of because they pulled it off against all odds right and, and we don't know exactly where that's leading yet either. exactly you know we don't we don't know uh, and then, and of course, you know, later on, you know, we have, you know, these, these, hey, you know, and actually that was actually quite an underrated novel that he wrote and, or she wrote. And, uh, and it's actually now it's a critical darling, you know, and it, it's like, why did these people even have this opinion it's so, so early on? It, it, it goes back to the little reaction thing, you know? I do think, I do, and yeah, I think you guys would probably agree. I do think most, well, actually, I don't know that if this is true, but maybe the more like well-known reviewers or something do seem to be like, like um, if an author they like uh, writes a book they don't like, they they're they're sure to like frame it in that light. Like, I love books by him or her, but this book didn't do it for me. I can't wait for the next one. You know what I mean? I do think the the like the the sort of like more well-known reviewers or something. I don't know if everyone on Goodreads is like that. I probably not. I don't. I, I haven't been there in seven years, but. Like, seriously, I haven't been on Goodreads in like seven years or something. That's crazy, man. <laughs> I went on there one day and I was like, nope. I was like, yeah. I was like, open the door. I was like, nope, that's what I mean. Like, that was another bar on that block, you know? Like, mm. I mean, like Alice and I walked in the back, that bar, I was like, nope, let's, yeah, let's, let's go. Yeah. Let's go up the road, man, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do think, Bob, I think you, you probably agree, is that like you and me, like, I almost feel like when our, heroes right like uh make a a movie that's maybe like weirder than what we want or or write a book that kind of like isn't so great there's almost something awesome about that too 
Mm-hmm. There's cool about the fact that Stephen King has written some bad books. It's cool. I know it sounds funny to say that, but it's true. It's cool that like I don't love every single Kubrick movie, that I don't love every single Hitchcock movie. There's something like some people would likely say that makes them more human, and I guess that's probably the right answer. But there's some like for me, it, it is more what you what you were just saying, more like that that journey. Like maybe maybe Barry Lyndon was a breakthrough for Kubrick. What comes after Barry Lyndon? The Shining, right? I think so, right? So you went from Clockwork Orange, where people are like, whoa, to Barry Lyndon, where I bet you a lot of people were like, oh, this guy's done. This guy's boring now. He's using, everything's by candlelight now, right? And then his next movie is The Shining. Mm. So, and that's exactly what you're talking about. That, like, the, Barry Lyndon is awesome, I actually. And I know everyone thinks that, doesn't matter. You get what I'm saying? There is, like, that mountain range to, like, the artist's career. And, I, and I, I've always thought that, the moment you've like had a real breakthrough as an artist, as a writer, as a musician is when reviewers start comparing your work to your previous work mm-hmm. rather than to someone else. So as opposed to like, mm-hmm. you know, I don't need to explain it, but it's fun to do it. Your first book comes out. It's like, Oh, this is like Stephen King or Dean King or something. But then your second book, they're like, well, in bird box, he did this and black man, Willie's doing this. And then by, you know, Daphne, there's a bunch of books to reference and you're like okay Mm -hmm. this is good because now we're talking about like that artistic mountain range we're talking about the canon the oeuvre the body of work Mm -hmm. rather than you know comparing it to like something else and just like dismissing someone yeah and i and i think that i mean of course like there are a lot of people who will have these questions about like I don't know the artistic value of their own work or like is is what I'm doing is this the best story that I I could be working on right now but I mean if if I ever get things like that which which like occasionally during that is boy I have it's like is this this really what I want to be spending my time on and it's like well it you know if if some people think it does suck if they think it like this was a a waste of their time reading it then it's like well well no matter because the next one hopefully won't be and it's like I've made the decision to work on this one now so if I come up with something that I think okay no this is this is what I should be spending my time on it's like well park that idea write it down briefly now you can work on it next but you made the decision to write this story now so bloody well see it through and yeah that's, that's what i do and and also and any time i get doubts about that kind of thing if i think oh this is a little bit too napoleon dynamite and less the great gatsby it's like yeah but I bloody love Napoleon Dynamite and Spinal Tap and the Greasy Strangler and even Freddy Got Fingered. So there is value in all of these things existing. Oh, yeah, and, absolutely. Yeah. Man, I had, I had a meeting today, today with Sky Alabar from yeah. the Greasy Strangler because, as I think you know, he starred in the short version of a Ben Evans film. Yeah. And... I'm a, I think I can just say this now. Today we got the funding for it. Oh. For, for, for that being a feature now. Yeah. Today. And so you you brought up the Greasy Strangler twice. The first time you brought it up, I was like, I almost said something then. But now I'm like, just, just talk about it. Um, yeah. Yeah, Ryan and I had a meeting with the financial guy today. Um, and then a meeting with James Hall, the director, and Sky following. James and his uncle Brett are directing. And um, yeah, that is going to be a feature now, a Ben Evans film. For anyone listening, a Ben Evans film is a <clears throat> short story of mine in which a fella is determined to make a feature movie no matter what. And he initially thinks of casting his parents as the lead roles. Both his parents die and he decides to use them as the lead characters anyway. So it, it, imagine him dressing up his parents as the different characters and doing the voices for each of them. <laughs> Um, throughout, mm-hmm. and I just imagine a total madman in his home making a movie starring his dead parents. It's called a Ben, a ben Evans film, and um, it was a short was made of it that I loved, but a feature, as of today, a feature is going to be uh, start filming in September. Yeah, 
Yeah. So I, I'm not sure how much you're able to talk about it, but <laughs> I mean, are, are you are you writing the script for that? Is there a different screenwriter? Yeah. No, James already wrote it, and I and I love it. It's freaking great. Yeah. I could just tell you a little bit more, I guess, because it, this wasn't in the short story or the short. Is that um, it involves Ben's trying to get that movie like into a festival. Mm-hmm. So, so that opens a lot of doors in terms of characters and other stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I really, really hope we get to see that. <laughs> yeah. yeah Sky yeah. is Sky's incredible. Man. I know. Yeah. He is, yeah. He's like, he kind of reminds me of like, um, there's something like just naturally Tim Burton y, like, like, uh, like a character, Charlie Chaplin y, like Pee Wee Herman y, like, there's a, he's like a mm-hmm. character in and of himself and and him as ben evans is like oh it's just so perfect man he's he's so perfect i can't yeah. wait for this yeah yeah how did you first get connected with sky i think i think james did it i think james and i saw the greasy strangler with allison late night and um we were like this is the greatest movie ever and then i think when James, he asked if he could make a Ben Evans film. And then I think he said, hey, I'm going to reach out to that guy, the, mm. the son in the movie. And I think James did that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, congratulations on getting the funding. And, I, yeah. and we're filming I'm, it here. We're doing it here in Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm like so excited right now. Like, yeah, it's like, uh, I don't know. I just, I, you know, like friends might be working on the movie and yeah. And James is one of my good friends. James is in the uh, troupe that does all the theatrical readings. You guys know we do that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. James is in that troupe. Well, crossing everything. Marty Feldman. Marty Feldman. The book is dedicated to Marty Feldman (laughs) and Ryan Lewis. I know. Uh (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for listening to This Is Horror with Josh Malaman. Join us again next time for the second part of the conversation in which we talk about Josh's new collection, Spin a Black Yarn. Josh tells us a real-life ghost story and he talks about a never-discussed film involving jizz. Yes, you heard me correctly. No, I won't elaborate. You just have to tune into the episode for more information on that one. And if you want to get that ahead of the crowd, and every other episode ahead of the crowd, become our patron at patreon.com forward slash this is horror. You'll also get to submit questions to each and every guest. And in a week, we will be chatting once again to a returning guest, Dean Coons. So if you want to submit a question for Dean, do consider becoming our patron. Patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, before I wrap up, an advert break. From best-selling author Lee Mountford comes a new supernatural horror series perfect for lovers of demonic haunted houses. Book one, Haunted Perrin Manor, follows two sisters as they move into an old family home, only to discover evil already resides there. The series is available in ebook and paperback formats and high quality audiobooks from producer Hannibal Hills. Search Amazon and Audible for Haunted Perrin Manor now. Don't just read horror, experience it. Cosmovorus, the debut cosmic horror novel from R.C. Housen. Esmeralda has lived on the fringes of society for as long as she can remember, until a Halloween night gone wrong unlocks a cache of nightmarish memories. Visions of a bizarre desert town, images of a mysterious woman, the pain of an ultimate betrayal, and the shame of a bargain made in blood. Now she must travel back and learn the true nature of the ravenous cosmos. Cosmovorus, available everywhere books are sold. As always, I would like to finish with a quote. And this is something to ponder from the philosopher Cato. An angry man opens his mouth and shuts his eyes.
I'll see you in the next episode for part two of Josh Malaman. But until then, take care of yourselves. Be good to one another. Read horror. Keep on writing and have a great, great day. This is Horror Podcast.